All right, so we are now doing reading 22, which is inter-corporate investments. Okay, this I think is uh, one of the most important items in FRA in level 2. And anybody who studies the financial statements of large companies will notice that large companies make investments in other companies. And if you, for example, if you are an analyst in the cement sector, you take a company like DG Cement, you will notice they have several, like they have investments in other companies. A company like Engro will have investments in other companies. Around the world, all large companies will have investments. The investments that a company makes in other companies, that is called a inter-corporate investment. So a financial analyst needs to be able to understand what's going on. To make our life interesting, there are several different kinds of intercorporate investments. What you as an analyst need to do is understand those different kinds of intercorporate investments. How do you figure out which particular category is being used and what are the accounting methods being used? Again, you don't need to do this in the detail that an accountant will need to do, but you need to understand the basic points. I've had some students in the past who've gotten so detailed into this from an accounting perspective that, you know, but they didn't pass the exam because they missed the big picture. Okay, These are pretty smart people. So I don't want that happening to you. So what we will try to do is make sure you understand the main points and then practice the questions. Okay. So what are the major types of intercorporate investments? One is simply called uh, investment in financial assets. This means that let's say you are a large company and you have some extra cash. With that extra cash, you buy shares in another company. Okay, maybe that other company is a strategic partner or whatever the reason. So you buy shares which represent about 5% of the shares outstanding of that company. This would simply be called investment in a financial asset because effectively what you've done is bought their stock. Or you might buy their bonds. Again, if it is a very small percentage of the outstanding issue, then this is called simply a investment in a financial asset. By owning 4 or 5% of the shares in another company, do you think you can influence what that company does? No. So in this, this category, the category 1, uh, investment in financial assets, the influence is not significant. And the rough ballpark is that the typical percentage, if the percentage that you own is less than 20%, <coughs> then it would be a financial asset, would be categorized as a financial asset. Okay, But these are rules of thumb, these are not definitive. The most important criteria is whether you are exerting influence or not. So if you own, for example, 18% of the shares of a company, but you happen to be the largest shareholder and exert a lot of influence, then it would not be categorized as a financial asset. Okay. Now the other category is, we say that you have invested in an associate if you have a significant influence on that company. So for example, if you have bought 30% of a small company, okay, you probably don't control what that company does, but as a 30% owner, you probably have significant influence on what they do. If that is the case, then the categorization is investment in a associate. Okay, so that's I, that's a second category and a lot of time is going to be spent getting into the details of all these categories. A third category is a joint venture where you sort of create a joint venture with uh, another entity. And then four is a business combination where two entities effectively, uh, let's say there is a, a merger of sorts and we'll talk about this in detail. And finally, we have something called variable interest and special purpose entities. So these are the types of intercorporate investments that we will spend time on rest of today and maybe even in the next lecture. So the first category was investment in 
financial assets and here actually again this is something you've seen in level one but again it's a little bit more involved here so investment in financial assets in uh, this is uh, these are also sometimes called passive investments why because you've just bought those shares you are not controlling or influencing that company in any way so investor cannot exert influence or control over the this funny looking term investee this is the firm where you have invested so you are not influencing any you're not influencing them usually ownership is less than 20 percent <coughs> Fortunately for us, IFRS and US GAAP have very similar accounting. Okay, and if you might recall from level one that when a company invests in financial assets, you either categorize this as held to maturity, held for trading, available for sale, or there is this term called designated fair value, which is a lot like held for trading, and we are going to. Talk about these four categorizations. In general, these terms are extremely important because those of you who work at banks have to worry about this terminology quite a lot. Whenever you have your assets, especially in the Treasury Department, you need to know where you categorize these because the accounting treatment is different depending on how you categorize. Okay, now for each one of those items, we will just talk about them in a little more detail. Held to maturity, held to maturity investments are investments in financial assets with fixed or determinable payments and fixed maturities that the investor has the positive intent and ability to hold to maturity. Held to maturity investments are exceptions from the general requirement that investments in financial assets are subsequently recognized at fair value. What does this mean? In general, when you invest in financial assets, you are required to show them on your balance sheet at fair value. What does this mean? If you buy a stock for $100 and six months later, the stock has crashed down to 60. Okay, at what value should you show this? In general, with financial assets, you should show this as 60. Now, let's say you bought a bond at par value for 100 and interest rates have gone up, so the bond value has come down to 90. Okay, let's say that it is a 20 year bond. What value should you show it at? 100 or 90? Okay, now the general rule with financial or the general direction with financial assets. What is the more uh, conservative thing to do? To show at the mark to market, show at fair market value. But if you have categorized the asset as held to maturity, then you are supposed to show it at historical cost or what is called amortized cost. Why? Because if you are holding to maturity, at the end you will get that par value of 100 anyway. So the fluctuations in between do not matter. So if you can show that an asset is held to maturity, to be able to assign an asset as held to maturity, there, there has to be an intent and the ability to hold the security till maturity. If you keep marking assets as held to maturity, but then sell them off before maturity, the regulator will come after you or the regulator should come after you. Okay. What, what is the accounting treatment that you do? You initially recognize the asset at whatever fair value that you purchased it at and then you simply amortize the asset. And we are going to do an example for this. Held for trading. So do you remember from level one what this is? So held for trading is where you buy an asset and you will sell it when the price is right. So when it makes sense to sell, you will sell. So that is held for trading. And held for trading needs to be shown at what price? Fair market. At fair market price. Okay, so you can read the text later. Available for sale is an in-between category, which I hope you recall. What do you do with available for sale? Do you show this at market price or amortized price? 
you show it at market price say you initially bought your bond for 100 and the market price comes down to 90 on your balance sheet you will show 90 that loss of 10 where is that shown that is shown under the other comprehensive income it does not show up in the income statement okay it bypasses the income statement and shows up in straight in equity in the subcategory called other comprehensive income okay this is a term that you might not have seen before but uh, called designated at fair value both IFRS and US GAAP allow entities to initially designate investments at fair value that might otherwise be classified as available for sale or held to maturity the accounting treatment for investments designated at fair value is similar to that of held for trading investments at each subsequent reporting date the investments are remeasured at fair value with any unrealized gains and losses arising from changes in fair value as well as any interest and dividends received included in profit or loss so this long-winded thing is essentially saying that the treatment is the same as held for trading so if you are not sure where to assign this is sort of like a short-term holding spot okay now here is where I talk about certain things where I don't think you need to get into the details as long as you know the big picture you are alright section 3.4 and 3.6 reclassification of investments so if you have something classified as held, held for trading can you reassign that to held to maturity okay the point in general there are all these little rules and at least my view is that you don't need to get hung up with those details if you are an accountant then you need to know all those rules but I think for the CFA exam it is unrealistic to expect you to remember every single detail but what you should know is both IFRS and US GAAP allow reclassifications but there are certain restrictions for example an obvious restriction would be you can't just take held to maturity and if you feel like it change it to held for trading and then two months later change it back so clearly there are some rules and restrictions if you are dying to figure out those restrictions read section 3.5 but the curriculum in its learning objectives doesn't harp on this so I won't sweat the details okay another general point that again is common sense is impairments so if there is an unexpectedly large drop in value for example due to the 2008 financial crisis the mortgage backed securities that you had suddenly lost 70% of their value okay that would not show up under normal amortization there is a major impairment that has happened what are you required to do there what do you think yeah. recognize an impairment loss and show that impair what's that loss going to be it's going to be the carrying value minus the present value of the future cash flows so effectively along the lines of what you saw in the earlier reading and where will this impairment loss be shown it will be shown in the income statement without getting into details what if you have a available for sale category item then the impairment losses will be reclassified any losses that you are showing in other comprehensive income will be reclassified in the income statement so, yeah so whatever the losses so far you just then show them in the income statement okay let's do this example and then we'll take a break okay so we have uh, this is example one from the curriculum two fictitious companies uh, so on 1 January 2008 Baxter Inc invested 300,000 in cartel company debt securities so the investment amount is 300,000 and it's in debt securities the par value is 275,000 so so the par is so is this a premium bond or a discount bond so this is a premium bond okay now again checking your level one 
knowledge. So this is a premium bond. So if we amortize a premium bond, as we amortize, will the value come down towards 275,000 or will it be going up? Come down. Come down. Come down. Okay. So what's the initial fair value? What do we record it? So initially we'll record it at 300,000. So when we talk about amortized cost, using the process that I will briefly show you here, but something that you studied before, amortization process is simply the process by which we go from 300,000 down to 275,000 over the life of this bond. Okay, so this is the picture. Assuming that the market interest rate in effect when the bond was purchased was 4.5%, if the investment is designated as held to maturity, then the investment is reported at amortized cost using the effective interest rate method. And just for your benefit, you are given the first few rows of the amortization table. How do you figure out the interest payments? So how does this payment come about? 4.5% of what? Of 275 or 300,000? Of the carrying value, of the initial carrying value. So that's the interest payment. Okay. So actually, is this the. Uh, so, so these are actually. We are doing this from the perspective of whom? From Baxter Inc. that is investing or Cartel Inc. Yeah, we are doing it from the perspective of the investor. Remember, this is an inter-corporate investment. So Baxter has made an investment in the debt securities of uh, company C. What? Okay, good. So actually, the point is that 4.5 percent, 4.5 percent of uh, of 300,000 is how much? Okay, so 4 point, let me just write this down. So it's actually written over here, 4.5% of 300,000 is the interest, interest income. Okay, so that's a good point. So interest income is always your carrying value multiplied by the rate. So that is defined as the interest income. What is 16,500 then? Coupon. Yeah, 16,500 is your coupon payment. So that's the actual Received. money that you get. Okay. So the amortization, the difference is the amortization. Okay. So your, your combination of the interest income plus the amortization is what will give you 16,500. Okay. Now our exercise if you found this clip interesting and informative, please visit my website www.rfirfanullah.com. Here you will find a tremendous amount of useful material. Right here in the 2011 CFA video lecture series, you will find the entire level 1 curriculum for free. And most of the material here is still relevant. So this is worth looking at. The 2012 video lecture series covers both level 1 and level 2. These lectures are available for a fee. And uh, finally, down here, uh, financial management at IBA. Here you will find my lectures at IBA uh, for a course on financial management. Plus, you'll find lots of useful spreadsheets that can help you with financial modeling. So again, please visit www.rfirfanullah.com. Thank you.